1993, when Trinity was less than a year old and met at Webster Intermediate School, we studied the Gospel of Luke. That's 25 years ago. It's been that long since I preached this great book, so full of truth, so full of diversity, so moving as you study it. And so as I thought about it this fall, I felt led to do it again. Once over 25 years is not too much, to do it again all the way through. And so as I said, with breaks for other things, we won't finish until Easter of 2020. But it'll be worth it. Every word of this book reveals Jesus, glorifies God, and through the Holy Spirit edifies us. Now, as we study, I hope you will fall more deeply in love with Jesus, the one whose deep compassion toward you is central. We're going to start with the first two chapters through the end of the year. These are the Christmas text. We've looked at them often, but they so perfectly laid the foundation for Luke that to skip them would be like building a building starting with the third floor. You can't do it. So today, we start with Luke 1, 1 through 25. The first four verses are Luke's formal introduction, focused on the certainty of the gospel record, and the rest begin the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they focus on the continuity of the gospel with God's Old Testament covenant and promises. We'll see today that we can have certainty because this gospel is the fulfillment of God's big story. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, having delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. I said these verses are a formal introduction. In fact, this is one of the most formal pieces of writing in the whole New Testament. The Greek is classical Greek rather than the usual Koine Greek of the New Testament. And Luke is formally telling us how and why he, he wrote this book. And he says that his account is based on eyewitness testimony that it's the result of careful investigation, and that it leads to certainty. So was the author an eyewitness of Jesus? No. He says that he's writing up the things that were done just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, just as they have delivered them to us. The author isn't a first-hand eyewitness, but he got his information from those eyewitnesses. So who was this Luke, whose name appears on the, on the earliest copies of this gospel? Well, it's clear that the author of Luke was also the author of Acts. Listen to Acts 1.1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So the author of Luke is also the author of Acts. The author of Acts was one of Paul's co-workers. Acts 16, Acts 21, Acts 27 and 28 are written in the first person. That is, they say, we did this and that, implying strongly that the person writing Acts was also the person present when those events happened. Luke fits that. He was one of Paul's co-workers, Mentioned three times in the New Testament, he was almost certainly a Gentile, a, a polished Greek speaker, who became a believer through Paul's ministry. Paul even says that Luke was a physician, a medical doctor. And as we study the gospel, you'll see its medical point of view. And finally, these we sections and in acts include quite a long period of time in Judea, when Luke could have done his research 
among the eyewitnesses, including the apostles and possibly Mary, the mother of Jesus. Notice, though, that Luke says many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Luke does not claim to be the only one writing a history of Jesus. We know, of course, of three other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. And there were probably other verbal or even written accounts which kept alive the teachings, miracles, suffering, and resurrection of the Lord. Now remember, the, the story of Jesus was, if, you, if you'll excuse the analogy, the Trump presidency of its day. It generated an incredible amount of interest, as, as testified to by the crowds throughout this book. So Luke and these others apparently felt the time had come to write these accounts down. Maybe the eyewitnesses were starting to get old or dispersed. Maybe the church had grown so much that not many could hear the eyewitness accounts. For whatever reason, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all decided that the events and teachings needed to be written. Thus, the Gospels. But Luke's was probably not the first as we study these books, there is a clear parallel between what Mark wrote and parts of what Matthew and Luke wrote. I, I believe Luke used Mark as a source. But, but he says he carefully checked things out. He talked directly to eyewitnesses. He added material, like the birth narratives that we'll be studying. And then he says, I organized the material, verse 3. It seemed good to me also to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Orderly could be translated chronological, but in fact, Luke is only broadly chronological. The first two chapters give the birth narratives of Jesus and of John the Baptist. Chapter 3 introduces John's ministry, and then chapters 4 all the way through 19 show the ministry of Jesus, but not necessarily chronologically. Instead, Luke gives in the works and in the words of Jesus, a careful series of episodes that gradually reveal his mission. Then in chapters 19 to 24, we will return to chronology of his suffering, death, and resurrection. Michael Wilcock, a commentator that I like, likens this orderliness to a feast. He says, it should whet our appetite to know what pains Luke has taken to prepare this meal, especially if we have become too accustomed to living on spiritual snacks. And I, I agree with that. This is not talk about Jesus. This is not dry theology. This gospel is Jesus himself living, moving, and acting in front of us. And that is food for the soul. That is the center of of our faith. When we study this book, we should, we will, I pray, experience Jesus in new and challenging ways. So Luke addresses this careful account to someone named Theophilus, who was not a dog. <laughs> All right, sorry, had a dog named Theophilus once. This common Greek name means lover of God. Some commentators noting that meaning, have said that this was not an individual person he's writing to, but that he wrote for the whole Christian community. And that is possible. More likely, there was an individual, Theophilus, who had heard about Jesus and hungered to know more. He may have been an official. He's addressed here with a complimentary, formal greeting. Most excellent, Theophilus. But whoever he was, Luke wrote so that he could have certainty. Michael Wilcox says, Luke places the word certainty emphatically at the end of this long sentence. Theophilus may have been brought up in pagan religion, losing its meaning as its gods multiplied. He may have had a strong desire for truth. And I think that's true in our day. There are many, especially some who have grown up in their church, who as adults have begun to lose certainty about the faith. Doubts have crept in. And in this gospel, God offers certainty 
about the basic truths of Christianity. Wilcox says, such knowledge can be yours. How? By a mystical experience? By a deep study of philosophy? No. By reading and meditating on the plain facts of the story of Jesus set out here in Luke's gospel. This is where you may come to know the basic certainties of life. Do you see what Wilcock is driving at? The Gospel of Luke was intended from the beginning to help people know for sure, without doubting. It's based on eyewitness evidence. It's compiled after careful investigation and instructs us in the truth about Jesus. But there is more than certainty here. There is also continuity. Though it's written to a Greek audience, Luke also intends to show continuity with God's revelation to Israel. In Luke's account, the ministries of Jesus and John the Baptist are not so much a new work being done as they are a renewal of the work God had already been doing through Abraham and Moses and the kings and the prophets. We can be certain of this gospel because it's the climax of God's big story that he'd already been telling for thousands of years. So Luke begins it with a time marker. Luke 1, 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Herod the Great, king under the Roman Empire, 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. He did some great things, great building projects. He rebuilt the temple, but he was also a horrifying tyrant, cruel to his enemies, cruel even to his friends, murdering even his own sons and wives in fits of jealousy, enslaving his people, taxing them, and using the Roman fist to put down opposition. That's Herod. And that's 4 B.C. Right, God had now been silent for a long time. The last prophet, Malachi, wrote in about 450 B.C., and though God had done many things in those centuries, things foretold by prophets like Daniel, there had been no new prophetic instruction for over 400 years. And yet, despite that, there were many at that time whose expectations were actually on the rise. People were looking for the Messiah, looking for the redemption of Israel. And now, in the years of Herod, as God's plan approaches his climax, God breaks 400 years of silence to renew his work. Luke 1, 5 through 10. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So God gets to work at a moment in history. It's while Herod reigns, and there's this priest. His name is Zechariah, the division of Abijah, married to a woman named Elizabeth, who was also descended from Aaron. And so Luke begins with that element of continuity to the ancient faith. He, he ties belief in Jesus to the truths about God revealed over the course of Jewish history. So by including these accounts, Luke is showing us that Jesus didn't just come out of nowhere. He is, in fact, the culmination of all that God had done and revealed for 2,000 years. So Luke starts with a Jewish priest and his wife. The priesthood was at the heart of God's revelation over those years. They showed us the picture of sacrifice as the means of redemption that would be central to understanding Jesus. And Luke goes on to say that both of these people were upright in the sight of God. He's not saying that they weren't sinful, but that they trusted God and that as priests they knew the meaning of the statutes and the sacrifices God had given as a symbol of his forgiveness. 
Lucas also alerted his readers that his, this ancient faith was one of morality and justice. The God, Gentiles that you've gotten involved with through Jesus, has revealed himself in laws and in decrees and as a holy God. I think, in fact, Luke wants to orient his Gentile readers to the truths of the biblical revelation. And even today, there are people all around us for whom this book might be their first encounter with the God of Israel and with the history of the laws and the heritage of his dealings with the Jewish people. Luke immerses his readers into that ancient faith. He immerses his readers into God's big story. And this is seen even in the fact that Elizabeth is unable to have children and well along in years. <laughs> Elizabeth has the same struggle as Sarah, the wife of Abraham, had, and Hannah, the mother of Samuel, and others in the Old Testament, so that we come knowing that God has a special place in his heart for the childless, and often in the Old Testament, he uses that to provide a special child to a couple. In the first scene, Zechariah's division is on duty, and Zechariah is chosen by Lot to go into God's temple and to burn incense. So he's going into the holy place, not the inmost holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, but to the outer room, which held a lampstand with seven lamps, a gold table used to offer bread to God, and the altar of incense a small altar of burning coals upon which a special incense was poured. So Zechariah's role is to go in to the altar of incense to tend the coal fire that's there and then to put incense on the fire where it would rise as a special aromatic smoke. Jewish history tells us, by the way, that a priest would only be chosen once in his lifetime to perform this duty. The incense itself was symbolic symbolic of the prayers of the people who at that moment were outside praying while Zechariah prayed within. In Psalm 141, David said, O Lord, I call to you, come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May, be, may my prayer be set before you like incense. In Revelation, in the heavenly temple, we see that the prayers of believers are incense rising before the Lord. And so we're beginning to see now that they are praying and that God is beginning to answer these prayers, verses 11 to 17. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at the, his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. The angel here is Gabriel, who had spoken to Daniel some 500 years earlier, near the close of the Old Testament. His new appearance marks the renewal of God's ancient work. God is beginning to fulfill his promises to the prophets. Like all angels in scripture, the first thing Gabriel has to do is to allay Zechariah's fear. Then he gets immediately to the heart of it. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will have a son. You're going to name him John. The implication could be that as Zechariah stood by the altar, he was praying that the Lord would give him a child. Possible. But I'm not so sure. It, it had been decades since there was any real possibility of a pregnancy. And this, this was the only time in Zechariah's life that he would enter the holy place. In that context, I think that he was praying for the redemption of Israel. And that's the prayer that is heard. Gabriel's promise here of a son was a sign of the larger prayers that were beginning to be answered. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth and that son were to be part of God's planned rescue of his people. The angel then describes the impact of their son's life. First, you will have joy and gladness. Well, that's natural. Zechariah and Elizabeth have to be thrilled at the gift of a child. But the angel goes on to say that many will rejoice at his birth, implying more than just friends and family. I mean, this child is not going to be just a blessing to his parents. He's going to be a blessing to Israel. In fact, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. From the very beginning of his life, he'll be set apart. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. His abstinence from wine and strong drink is characteristic of the Old Testament Nazarite vow, Numbers 23. In fact, John the Baptist may, as he began his ministry later, have taken that same vow because he's a child with a mission. First, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So John comes, and he's really the last of the Old Testament prophets. And the prophets always called for repentance. Turn. Turn to face God. So he represents continuity with what God has always been saying. But he's also the fulfillment of God's promises. Verse 17, he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. So Malachi 4, last chapter of the Old Testament, God says, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. The last promise of the Old Testament begins to be fulfilled in the first promise of the New Testament. That's the continuity that we're seeing here. And Gabriel says that John will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to the Lord their God. And he's clearly paraphrasing Malachi Malachi 4, 6. This is the key to his mission. For it is children whose fathers truly care for them who are most likely to say and receive the love of a heavenly father in the son who he's going to send. He will also turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And that, in fact, was a major focus of John's ministry. He wanted people to repent, to turn from their sins, to get baptized when we get to chapter 3 we're going to find that John calls people to simple, righteous living. And the reason is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Both Isaiah and Malachi foretell one who will go before the Lord to prepare the way. Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and then the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you light Behold, delight rather, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So John is that forerunner who prepares the way, who announces God's fulfillment of his covenant promises and the renewal of his work for his people. And we need to take seriously this idea that God will always renew his work in us and for us. I linked this week to World Magazine's article on Pastor Andrew Brunson. Fascinating story. He was imprisoned for his faith in Turkey for two years. He lost 50 pounds during the first year. He struggled spiritually. He says, I wasn't filled with joy. I was really broken. He found the Bible dry. It wasn't feeding me. He suffered from separation from his family and from fellowship. If I'd been let out after the first year, I'd have been lying in the floor, curled in a fetal position, with PTSD. But the second year, God started to rebuild me. So Andrew Brunson made a decision. I would keep talking to God. I would keep running after him. I would be a living martyr. He wrote a hymn, worthy of my all, about the things I was doubting, he says, and I sang it every day as a declaration to God. God always renews his work. He renewed his work in Andrew Brunson. He will do so for us. But the question, as it was for Andrew Brunson, is this. How will you respond to that renewal of his work? Verses 18 to 25, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news, this gospel. 
Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. They were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. He kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he's looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. So three reactions. Zechariah, he reacted with disbelief. How can I know? He's asking the angel for a sign. And, you know, it's reasonable. He says, I'm old. My wife's old. There's no human way we can have a baby. We don't know what tone of voice he used, how skeptical he was in his heart, but from the way Gabriel reacts, we can be pretty sure that Zechariah was not even close to believing God's word. So Gabriel says, paraphrasing, so do you often find angels unreliable? (laughs) I I mean, I normally hang out in the presence of God. If you won't believe me, who are you going to believe? See, the gospel is made certain because it reveals the supernatural work of God that cannot be explained away. You and I may not see the work of God clearly in supernatural ways in our lives, at least not very often, but we don't need to doubt because we have this record. We have the record of these clear, certain fulfillments of God's promises. And it's a trustworthy record. Next reaction is the crowd. Discussion. Verses 21 and 22, the people are waiting for Zechariah, and they're wondering, they're discussing, yeah, why is he staying so long in the temple? I mean, they're, they're supposed to be praying, but as the incense dissipates, they start speculating. Really typical. Then he comes out, unable to speak, and that sets off, we, we perceive, even more discussion. And that seems to be where it ends. They're, they're just discussing stuff, as so many th- people do in our own day, just talking about it without engaging with it. They didn't connect to the fact that God was beginning to answer their prayers and renew his work. All they did was talk about it. So, in our lives, when God gets to work, we can react with disbelief, we can react with discussion, or we can react like Elizabeth with devotion and faith. Verse 23, Zechariah finishes his week of service. Verse 24, He goes home, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. Her response is the one worth imitating. Thus the Lord has done for me. The Lord has done it. She believes, she responds to the Lord's work with faith, with certainty, with worship, with praise. Thank you, Father. You've shown me favor. You've taken away my disgrace, my reproach, my shame among the people. She knows that God is at work renewing his ancient work, and he deserves praise. He's fulfilling his promises. He deserves thanksgiving. He's been faithful to his people and to his plan. He deserves our adoration. God is faithful. Maybe you've wandered away. Maybe you've drifted into doubt. Maybe you've tasted depression. Maybe you've battled with despair. God is faithful. He will renew his work. He will never forget his love for you. He will come and do his work in you and through you in these days just as he did in those days. He will renew his work in us. So Luke shows us that God is a God of continuity. And we often call this faithfulness. He's a faithful God. He began a good work in the people of Israel, and in Luke 1, he brings, he begins to bring it to completion. And so this Gospel of Luke is carefully organized, researched, carefully written, and we can have certainty as we study this Gospel. We can have confidence from even these Advents accounts that God is truly at work, breaking into history, giving redemption to us as the climax of his big story, the story of the ages.